will extend a special welcome to you and thank you for coming today. We're in the middle of a series called Lord, uh, and it's dealing with temptations because we all have temptations. And uh, the temptation we're going to talk about today is the temptation to do nothing, to be complacent, to be a couch potato or whatever. And so we want to, uh, to deal with that. And we all deal with that uh, to some degree or another. In fact, there was a, a Christian sister in this church this week who told me about a dream she had. Uh, and I was in the dream. I apologize for having such a nightmare. But uh, she says she had a dream and, and I was in it. And in that dream, I was being kind of nonchalant and complacent in, a, in an emergency situation. And uh, she explained all of it uh, to me. And, you know, the Lord used that in my own life to kind of convict me of something I'd gotten complacent on uh, in my life here at the church. I, I used to have on my desk uh, a list of all the people who attended here that I, that I knew. And uh, I would go through part of that list every day and just pray for you. And I'd kind of, we'd grown a good bit, so it got kind of large, and uh, some people had failed to get on the list, and so I had updated the list sometime back, but I'd never printed it out, and it kind of, uh, I prayed for you collectively, but I had ceased praying for you individually, and so the Lord convicted me of that, and so I've, I've run off the new list, and I'm going to start trying to do that for you again, uh, and try to deal with that complacency. And we all deal with something in our life, in our Christian life, where we just don't want to get up and do it, right? We're going to talk about that a little bit in the scripture today. If you will, join me in prayer and then we'll get started. Lord, thank you that your diligence was so evident in your giving of your life for us. Thank you, Lord, that you didn't shirk any part of your responsibility, but that you, uh, you bore it out for our good. We're grateful for that. I pray, Lord, that you would work in our hearts by your Holy Spirit the diligence that you want us to have in our Christian life. Pray that you speak to us now by your spirit as we learn it, that we might apply it, and we might walk in your spirit and thus not fulfill the lust of the flesh. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, uh, let's, let's look at the scripture in the book of Jude. Uh, Jude only has one chapter, so you just write down the verses. It's Jude 3 and 4. That's verses 3 and 4. Or you can put it down as chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. It says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. It's two things he says there. He says, I've already been diligent to tell you about our salvation, which, which Jesus made a, a way for. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. And then uh, he said, but I also was compelled to write to you to contend for the faith. And that's the second part that we'll talk about after we uh, deal with the first. First, let's look at what is this common salvation. By common salvation means com the, the salvation that we have in common. Or in other words, your salvation is essentially the same as mine. The same thing was required for us uh, to get it. And I want to make sure that I'm diligent to lay out what that is. So we're going to look at that just briefly this morning. We're going to do it for the sake of those who, who maybe aren't born again in the room. That's the, our first hope. And secondly, so that we can learn how to contend for the faith, Amen. which we have to know something about it before we can do that. So, so what is involved in... Uh, in our common salvation, in the salvation that we all, at least those of us who have it, uh, have in a, in a crowd this size. There's some people in here probably who think they're born again that aren't. So pay attention and listen to this and see. First point, I got, I got several points on, on that. Uh, sometimes referred to as the Romans road uh, to salvation because most of the scriptures are out of Romans. First, you're born a sinner by nature and you acted, willfully acted in accordance with that. Okay? All of us are born that way. There is a common uh, notion in our country that people are basically good. Can I tell you that's unscriptural? It's untrue. They, we are born with a nature to sin. What's that mean? That means a dog is born with a nature to bark. We're born with a nature to sin. That's who we are. It happens before they really, before we even really understand sin. You ever have a little toddler look at you and say, no, don't do something? 
that seed showing up early. Now they don't know what it is yet and God doesn't hold them accountable for that until they reach an age where they can understand it. I, I don't want to get into that whole theology part there, but understand sin comes naturally to us. There probably 95% of you in here understand that if you just look at your own thought life and your own actions. We know that we are sinners and we are that way by nature. In uh, Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because if you raise it, we'd have to stop and debate it for a while, I guess. But surely everyone would agree if I asked you to raise your hand that you have sinned. Because we all have. We did that because it was our nature to do that. Because we were drawn away. Remember we looked at that a few weeks ago. We were drawn away by our own lusts. And, and we sin or we're tempted when we're drawn away that way. So first point. We're all sinners. We're all lumped under, under that one umbrella. Um, a person cannot get born again without acknowledging that. You see if you believe that you are already good. What need do you have for salvation? You can't be good enough. Okay, let me, let me put it to you this way. If you're making a cake, let's say you're stirring up a pound cake. My wife makes a killer pound cake. Okay, let's say you're making a pound cake. And for whatever reason, you take a tablespoon and you dip in the Tide bucket. And you get some powdered Tide. Looks like sugar, right? And you put it in that cake. How much sugar do you have to put in that to overcome that Tide? The number ain't big enough. Because you cannot get good enough by just doing more good stuff than you do bad stuff. It's a common misconception people have. They think, well, if I just do enough good, then I'm good enough. I'm basically a good person. You ever heard that? I've heard it so many times I won't throw up every time. Uh, you're not basically a good person. You're basically a bum, just like me. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be hateful or not. That's who we are by nature. The Word says it. We've all sinned and we fall short of God's glory. What is God's glory? Perfection. You don't have to be basically good because that's basically just some tide in your cake. We've all sinned and we must come to grips with that. Now, we're going to go on from this point. But if there's anybody in the room that doesn't believe you're a sinner, then you're, you know, in your original state. Now, if you're born again, I understand there's some theological things there. We've talked about that before. But I'm talking about in your beginning state, when you reach an age where you understand that you're sinful and you deserve the hell that God created for the devil. Because you've lined up with that. Okay, well let's, let's go on from that point. The first point is we've all sinned. Secondly, we are incapable. You are incapable of redeeming yourself. You can't be good enough. That continues the same point about the time and the sugar. You can't do enough um, to make it good. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. That's the normal payment for sin. In other words, what you earn, the debt that you accumulated by your sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. The wages of sin is death. So we're all sinners. Yes? Yes. Just means yes. yes. <laughs> we're all sinners. And we all are hopeless in that situation ourselves. Because we deserve death. And the only way to pay for that would be to live perfectly and we didn't do it. Therefore, we owe our life. We're in debt with our life. And that's what's owed. And that's why death comes as a result of sin. Okay? We can't redeem ourselves from that. Why? Because we already owe our life. What do we have to pay for it? We can give our life, boom, but we don't, you know, we don't get saved that way. We get uh, the condemnation that comes to us. Everybody, does that understand? Y'all understand yes, that? Sir. Okay, this is basic stuff. Third point is Jesus came and gave his life to pay your debt. Okay? You're a sinner. You can't solve that problem. Jesus came and paid that debt. How did he do that? He did it by living a perfect life. He didn't sin. Therefore, his life, which is pictured by his blood, his life is legitimate payment for you. Okay? It's legitimate. He can pay for your life by dying himself. So, uh, the wages of sin is death. The wages are paid by Christ so that you can be redeemed by Him. Got it? Um, I 
think I have scripture written down on that. Got, uh, Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He demonstrated his love for you in that while you were still acting out the life of sin, some of you more aggressively than others, but while you were still in your sins long before he knew you from way back when he was on the earth because he's God, okay? But from the beginning, when you were still in your sin, he had already paid for you with no guarantee that you'd ever receive it. He paid for your sins. When, when the blood of Jesus was shed out of his hands, his head, his feet, his side, all that stuff off his back, all that blood was shed to pay for your sins. Because see, the scripture says that life is in the blood, so that's a picture of his life. He's giving his life for your sin and my sin so that we can be redeemed out of our sinful state. That's really good news. Okay? I know this is basic. Stick with me because it's relevant as we, as we go along. Number four, you are invited, not forced, but invited to receive this gift. You know, if I was God, and I'm thankful I'm not, and you should be double thankful. <laughs> but if I was God, and I gave my son for you, don't go you be saved. You'd accept it. I'm just telling you. If you didn't like it, I'd pitch you here. Like I said, you should be thankful I'm not God. Okay? But he didn't do that. He gave his own son who died for you and for me. He gave his son to die for you with no guarantee that you were going to accept it because he wasn't going to make you. He invites you. Okay? You follow me? He invites you to take that gift he's given to you. Now, it's the best deal you're ever going to get. Okay? You can't invest better than that. You can't save better than that. You can't buy anything better than that. It's the best deal ever. And if the Spirit of God will draw you, draw your heart to Him, you can have that. And He will. He will. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It takes both. It takes both. It takes believing in your heart. That means none of this easy stuff where, yeah, I said a little prayer, I'm good, I got my fire insurance, I'm out of here. You know, I'm going to do all that Christian living stuff. I've done all I need to do. God's not interested in that. Because you've got to believe in your heart. And then you have to confess with your mouth that He's the Lord. You have to believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead. What's that mean? That means not only did He die for you, but He couldn't stay dead, but He was raised up. And He's at the right hand of God making intercession for you and me right now. This is what's required of you to be born again. It's all there is to it. You know, I, I tell you every week, if you want to get saved, come up here and I'll introduce you. Well, I'm introducing you right now. Okay? All you got to do is you got to believe that what Jesus did, he did for you, and that it was sufficient to pay for all that junk that's in you. And you have to confess that he's your Lord. He's not your get out of jail free card or your get out of hell free card. That's not what it is. He's your Lord. That means He's in charge. We're going to talk about that as we move on to part two here in just a second. But understand, that's what salvation is. Everybody understand what salvation is? Yes, sir. That's Jesus paying the price for you. Fifth point. This is intended to and will change your life. If it doesn't change your life, I'm not too convinced it's real. You might have just been emotional for a minute. And that happens to some people. You think, well, it's a good idea. Then you get back outside. And whatever the temptations are, you're overcome by them. For the cares of this world, whatever. If that's happened to you, just come back to Jesus. Okay? He'll meet you there. But understand that if it doesn't change your life, something's the matter. And ain't nothing the matter with Him. Okay? Because it is intended to change your life. And it will change your life. Um, Scripture I want to read there, Ephesians 2, 9 and 10. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself, it's the gift of God. Not of works, 
Lest any man should boast. That's putting the extra sugar in. It's not by your words, okay? Uh, lest any man should boast. If you can do it yourself, you can brag about it. You can't do it yourself, so you got nothing to brag about. That's what it's saying there. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which he laid down beforehand that we should walk in them. What's that mean? That's a whole lot of words. What that means is he recreates you. You are born again in the spirit. We talked about that some last week. Okay, you're born again in the spirit and he's recreated you and he intends for you to walk in the good works that he designed from the beginning. He designed good works. I'm not saying you got to go out there and, you know, I don't know what you got to do. You got to do what love compels you to do. That's what you got to do. Okay? I don't care if you go feed the hunger or whatever it is. Do it by, out of the love that God's put in your heart and then it's a good work. So go do that. It's got to change us or Something didn't happen. So that's the salvation that I want to talk about. So he said, I was diligent to write to you, back to Jude's uh, passage here. I was diligent to write to you about this salvation that we have in common. But I got this other problem now. I feel like I need to write you to uh, earnestly contend for the faith. And I really believe this is, this is addressing this problem that we have in American Christianity that we tend to just sit back and let everything happen around us. And let me tell you, it doesn't look too good. A lot of it. Uh, I forget who it was. I should have, I meant to look this up. Should have looked it up, but I didn't. There's a, some famous guy sometimes said, uh, all that is required for evil to prevail is for good men to do nothing. Such is the case in our culture today largely. Because we haven't learned how to contend for the faith. Now we've learned how to argue. We argue till we're blue in the face. And the world thumbs their nose at us. Says we don't want to hear that. You know what? I don't want to hear it either. You don't want to hear it either. Because arguments just, just create strife. We need to learn how to contend for the faith in a way that is profitable. In a way that is effective. And I think I got a couple ideas for you. Um, to contend for the faith, let me read a passage out of 1 Peter, chapter 3, beginning verse 10. For he who would love life, anybody here want to love life? I do. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, uh -oh. and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. And his ears are open to their prayers. Hallelujah. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you're blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats nor be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Okay, always be ready to give the defense for the hope that lies within you. And I want to talk about two ways that we need to contend for the faith. For the, the common faith that we have. The belief in that whole process we just talked about. That's the common faith I'm talking about. How do we contend for that? First, we do it with our behavior. Both our good behavior and our lack of bad behavior. Okay, I get really tired of hearing people, and this happens sometimes, I, in, in, in my former life I heard it maybe more often, I, I was in trucking for a lot of years, and I'd hear guys just quote all kinds of scriptures to you, and they just live like hell. Am I allowed to say that? <laughs> they live awful. Okay? Their witness is no good. You know what? Nobody wants to hear that. Our behavior matters. Yeah. Um, Last week as I was talking about the, all these things that are in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. You know, I had in my notes to, to make a point, and I just forgot it all together. That happens sometimes when I'm up here preaching. You most of the time don't know it, but I'm telling you about the one I forgot last week. Because I felt like God had told me there's an antidote for each of those categories of temptation. And I think it speaks now to the behavior we're talking about. First off, the, the temptation we have to the lust of the flesh. That's the, uh, the impulse to gratify uh, our flesh with an, uh, a legitimate desire with it by an illegitimate means. Remember that? We talked about that. What does the scripture say for us to do about that? Flee. Amen. That means run. 
They don't say flee, little bee, they flee, little bug, you know. Flee means run away. For the lust of the flesh, the antidote in Scripture is get away from it. Don't talk about how strong you are, how much you can resist. Get out of there. And that's what it says. Flee youthful lusts. That's what the, that's the scriptural antidote for the lusts of the flesh is get away from it. Uh, in in uh, chapter 7, I think, of uh, Proverbs, it says that uh, the immoral woman has slain many men and they were all mighty men. Because they didn't run away. That's what we're supposed to do. So the antidote for the, lust of the, for the temptation of the lust of the flesh is to run away from that. The antidote for the lust of the eye, remember that's the desire for stuff, the greediness and the acquisition of more stuff than you need and all that. The antidote for the, um, the lust of the eye is to be a giver. If you're a giver, you cease to be a taker. You cease to let greed and acquisition to rule your life. It's like God taught us to give. Okay? And I'm not a pretend telling you give me anything. I'm just saying be a giver. Be a giver. Because in doing that you set yourself free from the bondage of the enemy for the, for the lust of the eye. And then the pride of life. What's the antidote scripturally for the, for the pride of life is to serve. You know, my, uh, my wife's a really smart lady. And uh, she raised some pretty good kids for which I'm grateful, honey. You did good. But when when our three youngest, okay, we had a, a daughter, a son, and they both go to church here, and then three daughters that aren't here. And um, when those three were coming up, young teenager sort of years, we just referred to them collectively as the girls. They didn't like that. But we did. So the girls, uh, Patty noticed that the girls were getting kind of self-centered and whatever. And she said, what we need to do is we need to give them something to do, something way to serve. So she got these three little prissy girls up and she took them to a nursing home where they would give manicures to the ladies. Now, my daughter Sarah was a germaphobe. And for her to clean out the fingernails of some old lady, we'd like to send her over there. <laughs> but she didn't. And they went week after week to visit these ladies and began to, to develop a relationship with some of them. It, a lot of funny stories came out of it. Uh, but at least one got saved the week before she died due to their going there. And, uh, so they did that. But you know what? We began to see a change in their life because as they began to serve and they talk about, oh yeah, I miss so-and-so, this or that or whatever. I'm going to tell you the stories because you don't want to hear them anyway. But. <laughs> What we saw was they began to change in their demeanor. And let me tell you, that will happen to you too. If you will get up off of your complacency and get active serving the Lord in some capacity, I'm not telling you have to serve this church. Just serve the Lord wherever He tells you. This is a place you can. We have things you can do here. Please do it. It is good for your soul. It is good for saying, if, if you serve somebody else, it sets you free from that temptation to have others serve you which makes us get right. So that's the, the antidote that I forgot last week, but I wanted to insert it here where it seemed to fit just as well. Uh, we contend for the faith by how we live. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. Do you know what Scripture says that? That's how they're going to... I don't want to hear how much you know. I want to see how much you love. And that is an indication... Uh, and your behavior bears that out. Uh, we all know people who by their very behavior you say, man, that person just knows Jesus. And if you don't know anybody like that, you need to get out more. Because they're really firm enough. Because they are contending for the faith by the transformation that has occurred in their life. And the second way that we need to contend for the faith is with our words. First, it needs to be gentle and kind. And we talked about last week some people that we know that know the Bible the most or the meanest people we know. It ought not be that way. Right. Another scripture says, out of the same mouth comes blessings, blessings and curses. Brethren, it ought not be so. That should not be what it is. So our, our words should be like Jesus' words. They were gracious. It says when they listened to him, they marveled at the gracious words that came out of his mouth. Let the words of our mouth be gracious to other people. Be kind and all of that. But beyond just that, we need to be able to give a defense for the hope that lies within us. What in the world does that mean? Let me ask you this. If somebody came, at, came up and asked you, I'm assuming here for this question, 
I'm assuming that you know the Lord, that you're a Christian. If you're not, you need to get saved today. And I already told you how to do that. But if you are saved, somebody came up and says, why, why do you believe in Jesus? Could you answer that? Let me tell you, if you say it's because my mama and my grandmother did it, that ain't good enough. Because God doesn't have any grandchildren. He only has children. And you've got to know him yourself. But you need to be able to, I remember when Daniel was a boy. I asked, I've told this story before, but anyway. I asked him a question one time and said, Son, what do you think about something? I don't remember what the question was, but some issue of the day, I guess. What's your position on this? And he gave me a, a pat answer, an answer that you would expect somebody to give. I said, why do you believe that? He said, I don't know. I said, Son, I don't want you to ever hold a belief that you don't know why you believe. It's no good. You'll get wrecked. If, they, if, you just, if you're just believing something because I told you that's what you ought to believe, put it on the shelf and go seek God until you understand why you believe it. Okay? I, I won't purposely steer you right, but I'm just a person. I might get something wrong. You need to hear from God and you need to learn why you believe what you believe. And you need to be able to articulate it. Maybe you're not good at articulating it, but if somebody comes up and asks you, why is it you believe in Jesus? You ought to be able to say, because I was a dirty, rotten scumbug headed for hell and he paid for me and he set me free. If you don't know how to say anything other than that, you say that. That's your testimony. And then they say, well, I don't know if I believe in this Jesus stuff. I mean, he, he isn't really the son of God, is he? They'll argue that point. And you need to be able to answer those questions. If you don't know how to answer those questions, we're going to get to the three steps here in just a minute of what we need to do. Let me tell you, by your word, you need to be able to defend the faith that you have. Yes. And to do that, you're going to have to read up on it some. And you're going to have to ask questions when something doesn't make sense. When somebody says, why why God kill his own son? I mean, that sounds pretty harsh to you understand the whole reason. Okay? I understand the hard questions, but the hard questions have really good answers. Yeah. And we need to learn them to be able to share that with people. If we're going to contend for the faith, let me tell you, I don't want you to be argumentative. I want your life to be such that they can't deny it. That's right. And then the words that you have to speak. Daniel first went to his first job. Maybe it's his second job. I don't know. He's he was younger than he was supposed to go to work, so I won't tell you how old he was. <laughs> he went to work on a roofing crew. And he was a big old boy, so nobody would have known that he was too young. But I told him on the first day that he was going to work, I said, son, men do not want to hear what a boy has to say. You need to keep your mouth shut and do the work. And if you'll work and work hard, eventually they're going to ask you questions, and then you can talk. But until they talk to you, you just work and be quiet. I would say that's not real bad advice for us as Christians. Live a life, you know, the, I think it was Francis of Assisi said, uh, preach the gospel and use words if necessary. <laughs> well, it becomes necessary. Okay, words will have to happen. Uh, the, the Bible teaches that we have to preach the word. And that's all fine. But let me tell you, it's empty words until your behavior backs it up. So live the gospel that make people want to know what is it about you that's different? Ah, let me tell you about Jesus. Okay? Let me tell you about what he's done for me. And you can always do at least that much. And then you need to learn some of the others because they're going to pin you down. So then, how do we how do we get there? What do we do? You know, we've been this this whole series, uh, the, the notion I got from the beginning on how to deal with this. A topic of temptation was that the armor of God that's listed in Ephesians addresses the, the various areas of temptation. So that's what we try to do. And, and this week, the part of the armor that we've gotten to it has to do with the feet. And uh, so the, the scripture in Ephesians chapter 6, uh, verse 14 and 15 says, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. We talked about that two weeks ago. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. We talked about that last week. And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I want to talk now just a little bit about how, how we can contend for the faith by having our feet shod, that means putting on the shoes, okay, with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That's three things. That's preparation, gospel, and peace. And we'll talk about those briefly uh, as we begin to conclude. 
Preparations, that's learning the basics of your faith. Learn what we just talked about there a few minutes ago about how it is that you got saved. You ought to be able to explain that much. Somebody you might not remember all those verses, but you ought to be able to remember you're a sinner. You can't do anything about it. Jesus did it. You ought to receive it. That's pretty easy. Okay? You can learn that. Everybody in here can learn that. So we need to begin uh, to prepare uh, for the basics so that we can answer that question of why we are Christian or why we believe what we believe. And if you don't know how to answer it, ask somebody. Okay? I get I get emails and stuff from people and I'll answer them. If you don't know how to say, somebody asked me this question, I don't know how to answer it. Shoot me an email. Shoot me a text. If I get it, I'll answer it. If I don't know, I might say I don't know, but so far I, I've been able to give an answer to the questions that have come to me. But remember, we're preparing we're having our feet shot with the preparation of the gospel. Gospel. It's important that we realize that. We're taught, we're preparing to be able to share the good news. That's what gospel means is good news. We're not out there trying to share something, our political views or our cultural views, okay? I think free market economics is great, but it ain't the gospel. Okay? I think it's better than communism. It's not the gospel. Here, it's not the gospel. I think the Second Amendment's a good amendment. It's not the gospel. We need to be contending for what matters. And what matters is the good news. Ain't nobody getting saved because they towed a gun. Just say it. Okay? And I know there's a lot of gun toters in here. I'm not trying to make you mad. I'm just trying to get you focused on what matters. And what matters is the good news that yes. Jesus has come to redeem us. Yes. That's the good news. Yes. Let's contend for that. Woo. Let's contend for that. Um, the gospel is what set us free. Romans uh, chapter 1 verse 16 says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation. I'm not ashamed of that. Maybe stuff in this country I'm ashamed of, but I'm not ashamed of the gospel, and that's the country I belong to. That's the citizen that I am. Let's don't be ashamed of that, and let's defend that. And the, and the third point has to do with peace. Okay, We're having our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The gospel that is efficacious. That's a 50 cent word you can pay for later. If something is efficacious, that means that it has the effect you desire. Okay? The efficacious gospel is the one that brings peace. Now, I know you can quote the scripture to me that Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace but a sword. That was talking about dealing with ungodly stuff. What I'm talking about is this being set free that we can have peace. That should be the result of the gospel. And if the gospel we're taking didn't bring in peace, we need to evaluate what we're doing. Now, I understand they may persecute us for it. But certainly we should be at peace when the Spaniards came to the New World to settle, uh, to explore mostly. Uh, and to exploit might be a better way of saying what they came to do. Uh, they wanted to convert many of the natives to Christianity. And they, they presented them with, a, uh, with an opportunity where the sword held on to so convert or die. A lot of them <clears throat> converted. Let me tell you, that's not the gospel. That's, that's the way some other religions still do. They, they uh, convert by conquest and hold, hold you to it by uh, threatening your life if you leave it. That's not the gospel. The gospel we have is a gospel of peace. Okay, You can leave it if you want to. I'm not, that's not a discussion of eternal security or whatever. Please don't, don't get theological on me here. What I'm saying is we're not holding a gun on you or a sword on you to believe. And Jesus said, "Need it's all voluntary. Whosoever will may come. Okay, he he draws us, but it's a gospel of peace, and that peace will overcome war. And I and I submit to you, the Roman Empire is a case in point, where they did everything they could to stamp out Christianity. Christianity completely took them over and changed it. And then when it became the, <laughs> when it became the government religion, they ruined it." It got messed up, but it still spread other places. The sword can never stop the gospel, though it tries. But it's the gospel of peace, and it should have that effect on us. Um, the true gospel brings freedom, even if they lock you up. It brings life, 
even if they kill you. Do you understand that? Because it transcends the capabilities of this world. We must prepare ourselves. If we want to overcome the complacency in our Christian life, we must prepare ourselves to carry the gospel of peace to those around us. And we carry it in our actions and we carry it in our words. Everybody got that? You're looking at me like a calf looking at a big gate. <laughs> Thank you, Randy, for that. <laughs> Please, I'm for you. As, as the pastor here, I ask you, let's begin in our country to contend for the true gospel with our lives and with our words, with our understanding, with our skill set, with our giftings. Let's do that. Band's going to come now. If you're not born again, I've just told you what, what's involved in getting saved. Why don't you just come up here and confess it with your mouth to me that Jesus is your Lord. We'll talk about getting you saved, baptized, and all that stuff. Okay? That's not hard. I've explained it. I can repeat it if you if you need further understanding. But if you haven't been born again, you need to. So I invite you to come for that. The altar is open for prayer. If you need to pray about something, if you've been complacent, maybe you need to repent. No, if you've been complacent, you need to repent. Just like I needed to repent. Okay? So if you want to do that at the altar, it's here for your benefit. You don't have to. I say it every week, but Jesus knows you right where you're sitting also. If that's where you want to pray, it's fine. But often it helps us to make our body obey and go to the altar and pray. If that's the case for you, please avail yourself to it. If we can pray for you in any way, uh, come let us do that. Okay, let's stand together and worship.
word of our lives, Lord, that we that we live out the word that we hear and that we don't just hear it and let it tickle our ears. 